When Bridget and Andy and I were putting together this program for the Professional Development Seminar, we were noticing amazing images of jewelry on models. And we've heard this mentioned several times today. But we were seeing jewelry shot on models Vogue style with seriously co-tiered models. And these photos were striking and glamorous. And we were instantly intrigued. We needed to know how these jewelry artists got their work on the models in the first place. And it turns out, much to our surprise, that it wasn't the jewelry artists themselves who were responsible for this photo magic. It was someone else. It was the stylist or the fashion editor. Our next speaker today is Toronto editor Michelle Bilado. She is a freelance fashion and beauty writer based right here in Toronto. She has worked and contributed to the top magazines in Canada, including Flair, Fashion, Chatelaine, Hello Canada, and the Huffington Post Canada. Bila Doe is also editor of FrontRowMag.com a fashion and beauty website that seeds upwards of 30,000 views per month. Michelle will open our eyes to new opportunities that we never knew of using Purple Cow Visibility. Welcome, Michelle. Thanks so much, Harriet. I know 30,000 page views might not sound like a lot to somebody from the States, but up here in Canada where our population's a little smaller, it's, it's a kind of a big deal. Thank you again for having me, everyone, and I'm surprised that I'm last, so I will try to be as entertaining as possible. So first off, I just wanted to start by talking about where you can send and basically how to put together a pitch to get noticed by an editor or a stylist. So my very pithy presentation is called 10 Tips for Catching and Keeping an Editor's Attention. And as Harriet mentioned, I've been an editor for quite a few years, probably about 13 years now. So first off, know what you're selling. You guys obviously are very familiar with your work. You're very passionate about what you want to do. And I know you've heard it all before, but branding is very important. In terms of editorial, looking at different designers that may be similar to your work, including labels like clothing, shoes, other jewelry, even home decor and kind of architecture. Look at different artists. Look for different reference points from movies and television shows. Think of kind of any upcoming cultural events. For example, The Great Gatsby that just opened. And last Christmas we had Les Mis. If your work is in any way similar to that kind of aesthetic, look and do a bit of more, like do some research to kind of bolster your knowledge on that area and, and see where your work can maybe apply to a magazine in that way. As I said, brands are very important, so this will also help you kind of establish and hone in on what exactly you want in your brand and your brand's aesthetic. My second point is getting a fresh perspective. As a freelance journalist, I find that I'm often sitting at home writing by myself. And I've found over the last few years that that can be kind of boring. And being in your own head, you get kind of, you get, you can get kind of stuck. So talk to friends, talk to colleagues, talk to friends of friends. If you know someone who you think is kind of stylish and you see them on the street, stop them and try and get their opinion on your work or just strike up a conversation on what you're doing on jewelry in general. And, you know, if they have a great piece that they're wearing, people love to talk about things that they're passionate about. So if you point something out to them, they'll want to talk about it with you. And that's a great way to brainstorm and get new ideas and basically learn different ways to collaborate with people. We've all heard about word of mouth. We've heard about networking. And talking about what you love to do will only bring more people kind of into your social circle. And an extension of that is number three. I think you guys should just keep creating. I know that that's what you love to do, so don't ever stop doing that. And another way to make sure that you do keep creating is by collaborating with other people that are working in similar avenues as you. And then they might have an in to a magazine or a website. So if you're working with someone on a great piece for a runway show or for a photo shoot, 
they might know of an editor or a stylist that you can then reach out to. Collaborating is kind of the key in, in a lot of areas, and I feel like jewelry making it could be as well. Like a way to try and get experience by working on photo shoots and runway shows and the like. Consider local art shows. In Toronto, we have a great yearly show called FAT or Fashion Art Toronto. And it's very much about marrying fashion and art together in one. Look at, you know, the one of a kind show, which I know some of you already do in Toronto. But those kind of shows are great ways to network and to build and to start trying to make contacts to editors like myself and stylists that are out there. Number four, and this very much goes to what Rachel was speaking in terms of photography, is learning how to highlight your work. Before you get ready to pitch an editor, work with a photographer, whether it's an up-and-coming photographer or a student. Have them, you know, show you how to light your work, present your work. And Rachel did make a great point about everything being on white. White is very important, especially for an online editor for myself or even editors at the big magazines, because... It gives them an idea of your work and it shows off the intricate detail of what you've put into it without showing them any bias. So it'll give them a way to look at your work and figure out how they can use their own imagination with the piece that you've created. And Rachel was right. Anytime somebody presents something to me, I always ask, do you have it on white? Can I get it in high res? So being prepared and having that already set aside when you, before you're ready to pitch an editor, I think is very, very key. And next, I think it's very key to know your audience. Know where you think your work could apply and know the magazines that you're hoping to pitch. There are very different magazines for very different areas. If you're looking to get something in a fashion magazine, more fashion-forward magazines in Canada include Flair, Fashion, Lulu, Elle Canada, Toronto Life, there's a new mag called Chloe, and a little plug for my own website. They're very much fashion websites, so think of the runways, think of style.com, think of Vogue. If you want your items to appear there, Use that as inspiration. If you want something more lifestyle, look at magazines like Chatelaine, Canadian Living, Wedding Bells, Zoomer, or Hello Canada. Those are a little bit more lifestyle-centric, and you might be able to, to get in that way. High fashion may not be for everybody, so think of different ways to get in, either if it's the beauty sector or health or lifestyle, like I said. And don't forget about us web people. Web is very important, as these two gentlemen have said, and it's growing every day, every week, every month in Canada especially. And each magazine actually has their own website as well. So think about potentially pitching a magazine editor's or an online editor, and I'll kind of get to that in a bit. But also, are there any personal blogs that inspire you? Do you follow any, you know, Gracie Carroll is a well-known personal blogger in Toronto, and she's known for her style. Same with Anita Clark, who runs a website called I Want, I Got. And it's, you know, very much those kind of fashion plates, those kind of girls who are out and about, and they're seen in the fashion industry, and they're running these little side businesses, which is their, their online websites. Consider pitching them as well. You don't necessarily have to stick to just pitching fashion magazines. Thankfully, there's a lot of options out there, and web is uh, one of them. So, yeah, I just mentioned not forgetting about webs and also websites, and also don't forget about kind of local media as well. If you're not necessarily from downtown Toronto, if you're from Hamilton, if you're from outside of the city, look to get some experience by, by showing your work to somebody at a local newspaper or a local community blog. Any sort of little hits that you can get will be great experience in terms of media exposure, and it'll just start building a little bit of momentum, which is what you would like. Some popular websites to also consider is the HuffingtonPost.ca, which Harriet mentioned, LuxLife, Stylist.ca, Vitamin Daily. So keep kind of on top of of what's new and upcoming. It can seem kind of daunting, but Canada's finally getting into the web game a little bit more, which is which is very interesting. And number six, I called it Think Outside the Jewelry Box. So when you're looking at magazines, look at lifestyle, fashion, and and what have you, but also look at the photo shoots that they create inside. You may want to pitch for a fashion trend story, and that's 
fantastic. If your piece warrants it, it could get noticed for sure. But don't forget that there are some really great photo shoots that happen in other sections of the magazine, including really creative and inspiring beauty shoots where the model, the makeup, and this stunning piece of jewelry is the focus instead of clothes and, and accessories and whatnot. And also think about fitness and health stories. If, you're, if what you're creating is more down that avenue, maybe consider pitching the health editor and not necessarily just the beauty and fashion editor. And here we kind of have the magazine hierarchy. So this is pretty interesting in the fact that, you know, you have the editor, the managing editor, the art director. The editors-in-chief of most big magazines are usually very busy. So in my experience, it's better to go a little bit lower on the totem pole in terms of pitching. You might actually gain some traction that way instead of sending an email to an editor-in-chief who gets probably 500 emails a day. So look to the masthead of a magazine and find out, do some research and find out who these people are on the hierarchy on a magazine. Your fashion director, your beauty director, and even a photo editor can influence stuff that ends up in a magazine. Going down from kind of the first diagram, the fashion director usually has a market editor and a fashion assistant underneath them. A beauty director usually has a beauty editor and the health editor underneath them as well. And these are different avenues and ways to get in someone who might see something when they have time and then bring it to their fashion director or beauty editor and say, hey, look what I found. This could be a great story idea. And then they can run with it. It's basically the assistant or the associate's job to sift through emails and present their boss with these fantastic ideas, which hopefully is, is from you. And again, this is called making contact. So the best way to make contact with an editor is through direct contact, through email, basically, or even a phone call. You'd be surprised how people don't actually phone people that much anymore. It's all through email, and if you want to make sure that your email doesn't get lost, try picking up the phone. You'd be very pleasantly surprised. But here, I took a photo of Fashion Magazine's latest masthead. So just so you guys know what a masthead actually is, when you're flipping through the front of the book, this comes just after the page, the contents page. Um, it just has the magazine's logo, and then it basically has the hierarchy of everybody who works at the magazine, their first and last name, know their title, know the spelling of their first and last name. These people work with words every day, so spelling their name correctly is very important. You can look at the bottom of a masthead and usually find the publishing house's phone number, as well as possibly the formula, the email formula that every publishing house uses. I've worked at Flair and a few mag at different magazines, and when I was at Flair, for example, my email was michelle.billado at flair.rogers.com. So each publishing house will have a different formula. When I worked at Fashion Magazine, my email was just mbillado at fashionmagazine.com. So try and look on the masthead and see if you can find an example. And if you can, as I just mentioned, there should be a phone number for the big publishing house. Call reception. They're very lovely people. Just ask for the correct email address or to confirm the person's email address and they'll be more than happy to help you. One more little side note, magazines work about four months ahead of everybody else, which is not something that everybody knows. So right now we're in May coming into summer. You might be surprised to know that magazines are actually closing all of their fall books around now. So September is probably pretty, pretty much already done, and they'll start working on October and November going forward. So when looking to pitch the bigger magazines, consider that they work four to six months ahead. So if you want to get all your stuff together, get all your ducks in a row for next fall, make sure that you realize that you'll be pitching for spring 2014 and not for fall 2013. But thankfully, in terms of online, we have a lot quicker turnaround. I would suggest giving an editor like myself about a month's lead time if it's something super trendy. Say if it's something that, you know, goes to a gala event, a spring gala event, or something that you wanted to wear to a summer wedding and you wanted to pitch it within that theme, give me about a month's time just so that I can build it into the stories that I'm already working on. And then in terms of if you have the means, this is not, you know, for everybody at all, but consider working with up-and-coming public relations firms or boutique agencies. Again, try working with maybe a student who is taking marketing and branding in university and see if they can help you out in terms of branding your work, helping you put together a pitch idea or a press release. 
that's their job. That's what they do or that's what they're aspiring to do. So working with an up-and-coming brand will help someone who's also up-and-coming get the experience. And it's, you know, again, that kind of community feeling that everyone gets the warm and fuzzies about, which is good. Their job is to do branding. Their job is to do marketing. Their job is to do editorial outreach. Their job is also to help with media training and interviews. I know I'm very well spoken now, but I wasn't that great before. Being on air or being interviewed and asked questions about what you do can sometimes seem a little daunting. So having someone kind of coach you through that is fantastic. And here I just listed some great names of PR firms that I work with quite a bit in Toronto. Some are bigger than others, but again, just look kind of the formula of the names if you're looking for an agency. There's, you know, communications, promotions, PR, associates, all that kind of stuff. Those are kind of the PR companies that you might be able to do some research and get in touch with. And lastly, don't be discouraged by no. Maybe one editor passes on your idea. That doesn't mean that another another editor will. Editors and stylists have very specific biases and their own sense of style and taste. And just because something gets passed on by one person, like I said, doesn't mean that someone else won't gravitate towards it and love it. And of course, it's fashion and our tastes change every season. They change on a whim. So don't be surprised if you get turned down by one person and someone else welcomes you with open arms. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Okay, we have time for a few questions with Michelle. And I have a question for Michelle. What's the role of a stylist? So a stylist is essentially someone who is freelance. Their name would appear probably in the contributor section on a masthead. The fashion editor is also kind of a a stylist in a sense. Stylists work at different creative agencies. So an agency that represents a makeup artist and a a hairdresser that does editorial work would also represent a stylist. And the job of a stylist is basically to get direction from the editor, from the fashion editor, take that direction, go to different stores, shops, you know, either the bay, different shops at the mall, even local stores, and find pieces that fit the story that they're wanting to create. Those stories are usually based on the trends that are seen on the runway, or sometimes can be based on movies, television shows that are popular. I know a few years ago when I was working at fashion, Susie Sheffman, who is a very well-respected fashion editor and stylist in the country, noticed that there was a kind of a theme running through the runway shows, a lot of clothing that reflected Pretty Woman. So she created a photo shoot, a 10-page photo shoot, based on the Julia Roberts movie. So the job of a stylist is to come up with help come and collaborate on a theme but then also to pull the clothes is what what that's called i mean how do us the jewelry makers mm. connect to that stylist the person who might be putting together that photo shoot that's a little bit difficult you'd have to go through their agent um so stylists like i said most of them have agents if they're not directly on staff at the magazine there are different agencies in toronto for example there's platino group there's judy inc I'm trying to think of the other ones. There's page one. There's a bunch of different actual agencies that represent these people and go out and get them work. Okay, there's a whole bunch of questions at the microphone. (laughs) Hi, my name is Britta. And um, when you say pitch, are you talking about something very specific, like we should have a specific in mind, or how do you generally pitch, like just showing you, sharing your work? I think... Yeah, I think it's best to have a little bit of a specific in mind to do some research and kind of have a theme in mind when you're pitching. And pitching can be anything from just calling, but also maybe putting together an email that sort of resembles a press release. You don't necessarily have to go that extreme, but helping the editor see kind of your vision through different examples and how you would pair things is very helpful for them in a way, because it it shows them the avenue that they could take your stuff. And then having an image on white can just show the intricacy of of the design that you've created. So it's it's kind of a little bit of give and take. It's giving them a little bit, but also showing them something that just shows off your work and letting them use their imagination. This actually ties into the same thing uh, about Mm -hmm. pitching. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm interested, my name is Dorothea Rosen. Uh, my uh, uh, question is about the protocol of communications. Um, sometimes I have the feeling if I send an email that has my website link at the in it mm-hmm. and it has a bunch of attachments, it goes maybe straight into the spam folder. Yeah. How large an uh, yeah. file is okay to send? Is it better to send it in the mail on a USB stick? 
What's your opinion? Um, that depends on, like I said earlier, about your means. If you, if you have access to USB ports and you want to send them via mail, by all means, go for it. If you want to print off kind of a little one-pager about who you are, definitely. Um, but I would be wary about sending oversized emails unless they're asked. Having low-res images that you can put into your email so that you make sure it gets through, but then make sure you have the high-res images to send so that they can actually use in the book or on the online. Be very kind of wary of emails because they will bounce back, especially if it's you know, Hotmail or Yahoo or whatnot. Um, if you try, if you have an email from your own website, it might be a little bit better because the publishing houses might recognize those a little more. But yeah, try keeping it succinct. I would say like a one pager, one or two images that you feel best reflect your work and go from there. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, I'm Victoria Lansford and my question is for you and also for Rachel. Okay. Um, Probably over half my work fades away on a white background. Okay. So what's an alternative background to use that will still look up to date? Try using all black or even, I know it seemed, you were saying it was a bit more out of date, but something a little grayscale maybe? Yeah, I think graded backgrounds still like, you know, can definitely showcase a piece. Um, if it's a format where you can have a model and if it's a, a wearable piece or an object that maybe the, the person can help to show the scale of the object, mm -hmm. that that might be the best route. Or even try um, a Judy. I've noticed if it's a necklace, um, per se, or s some kind of mannequin, maybe for a bracelet or whatnot. But I have a friend who, who creates his own pieces, and he did, for his Etsy shop, he did just a Judy against a wall, just to show a bit of depth and, dyna and dimension to what the piece. A mannequin. Oh, a Judy? <laughs> sorry, it's a mannequin. It's like a, sorry, <laughs> I'm used to, it's like a sewing. It's what people used to sew a garment on, basically. Yeah, they, I don't know why they called her Judy, but that's her name, so. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, you're welcome. My name is Jana Brevik, I'm in Seattle, Washington, and most of you know me as a studio jeweler. I have recently, well, in the last four or five years, I've been working as a stylist, and I wanted to speak to your comment about, um, or question about models. Almost every big city has modeling agencies, and you can look on their website and pour through pretty faces if you want something really professional and <laughs> and you have some money. Models run about maybe 600 to 1,200 a day, and that's, they usually don't work a half day, so any, that's something to consider. I mean, I know we spend a lot of money on pearls and diamonds and things, but if you want a gorgeous professional person and you're at that level, it's really worth calling a, an agency. Uh, they're really nice. They work really hard to get the right person for you, and they have, there's a huge diversity in that. They've got athletic models and, you know, just simple, beautiful faces, etc., bodies. And then also, as I've been kind of digging around in this funny world of styling, the, the personality of the stylist is really important. And like you said a few minutes ago, every magazine has its own personality. And you'll meet somebody that's really into rock climbing, and so all the things she styles end up in some sort of thing like that. But really, if you are wanting to go and try to find those people who had them, they're even mystical to me. I just start talking about it, and you're welcome to approach me. I, my email's in the list of people at, at the conference, Jana Brevik. I never know where my next job is coming from in styling, so there's always a chance for, that I can throw jewelry in, and I can't, you know, just always pimp my own stuff. <laughs> All the time it gets a little obvious. So, um, <laughs> so you're welcome to, to bug me. Thanks. Um, just to kind of further Joan's point, to be honest, a lot of modeling agencies actually have new faces divisions as well. Um, I was a model for a while when I was a teenager, which is, again was a very long time ago, but I would work for free. They send their new faces out for, with up-and-coming models, up-and-coming stylists to do what are called creatives, um, and that's a way to give everybody some experience. So if you are looking to use a model that's not just a friend, definitely consider asking them about their new faces division, basically, is what they're usually called. So. I'm glad you said that. Uh, <laughs> Michael Geik, I'm going to follow off exactly what you said. Yeah. My wife and I have a business. Uh, her name's Courtney Sterrett. And we've been fortunate enough to find a fashion photographer in Charlotte who works with new models. Mm -hmm. And the new models, or the breaking into the business models, are looking to build their book. Yeah. So they're looking to do free work and we pay the photographer, she brings the models to the stage. Yeah. Uh, 
Hi, my name is Jude Radwanski, and I'm a student here at George Brown in Toronto. And I'm curious, I'd like to one day be designing fashion jewelry. And so I can imagine myself contacting a stylist. I live in central Canada, small town. If I send them pictures of my work and they like it and they want to use it in a shoot, do they purchase from me or are those items on a borrowing status? They're usually out on loan um, and I would highly recommend getting your pieces insured in case something happens while they're sent out because unfortunately as delicate as stylists can be with items, they can maybe get damaged in transit um, or if they happen to be on a 16-year-old model who's not really paying attention, um, you want to make sure that your pieces are insured for what they're worth. And if I sent some out, how long do they, would I expect for them to be in the stylist's hands? Good question. Um, it depends. I definitely ask them when they're planning on shooting. The thing about editorial is it's very fluid. Um, you can have a date set when you're shooting and something can happen with either the weather or the venue you're shooting falls through. I've had that happen to me a couple times. So it can be very fluid, but try to get as much information as you can. It could be anywhere from two weeks to a month to a month and a half, to be honest. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hello, my name is Katie Kimber, and I have a question. Um, just going online now with my work, and I'm a little timid about putting it on Facebook, though I see how that's been, like I've really noticed others' work, so I can really uh, keep up on it because I can just pop onto Facebook. Um, but I'm a little timid about people taking images or just just leaving it out there and letting it go to Facebook. or. I don't know for anybody else here, but to be honest, I kind of hate Facebook, which is really awful to say for someone who's an online personality. So I use my personal Facebook for promoting the website more than I use it for personal use. So I don't know if that's a confidence booster for you at all, but a lot of people do do that, and, and I think it's, it's great. It's a great way to get more of a personal more of your stuff out there personally, whereas I think Twitter and other social media is a little bit more about the social. Facebook is, they're your friends. They're people that are going to talk about you in word of mouth, like, like he just said. So use Facebook because they definitely use you. So use them back. This concludes the lecture by fashion editor Michelle Bilado. 10 tips for catching and keeping an editor's attention. From the 2013 Snag Professional Development Seminar titled Sacred Cow, Purple Cow, Cash Cow. Look for the five other presentations with recorded audio. An introduction to Sacred Cow, Purple Cow, Cash Cow by the organizers Andy Cooperman, Bridget Martin, and myself, Harriet Estelle Berman. The Unexpected Purple Cow, Pop-Up Stores and Alternative Exhibition Spaces by Natasha Granitstein. Purple Cow Documentation via Video and Photography by Rachel Timmons. Bringing the Purple Cow to Market, Tapping into the Experience Economy by Laura Bazant. Justin Hartsman and Jeremy Perea from All You Can Eat website speak about customizing the cow, new trends in cross-platform web optimization. These presentations are from the SNAG Professional Development Seminar that takes place each year during the SNAG Conference. The presentation sponsors are SNAG. Society of North American Goldsmiths, and MJSA, Manufacturing Jewelers and Suppliers of America. Look for all six presentations from Sacred Cow, Purple Cow, Cash Cow on the Professional Development Seminar page. There are two locations and the links are really long, so this slide has two tiny URLs for finding this information. There are 21 slide presentations with audio from past professional development seminars in addition to a selection of handouts. This information is available for the arts and crafts community on the professional development seminar page found on the SNAG website and my website. Ask Harriet offers additional materials on many of the topics developed during the PDS. 
Contact me anytime with comments, questions, or suggestions for future professional development seminar topics.